Good morning. Welcome to the CBI webinar about specialty rice. We're very happy to have you joining us today. And welcome to so many attendees from so many different countries in the world. I am going to share my screen. There we go. And introduce myself. My name is Tonya Dabwe. I am the founder and chair, founder and CEO of Guide My Growth, a company that works with businesses in developing countries to help them um, launch and increase their business growth through higher profitability and funding. I'm the daughter of a Liberian father and a Dutch mother, so a lot of my work is actually focused on Africa. As I said, welcome again. You are present at the CBI webinar about specialty rice, and I'm just going to walk you through the key points of GoToWebinar, as well as the key points of what we're going to be addressing today, so you can know what to expect. Housekeeping. Um, please note that we cannot see you, and we cannot hear you, and you cannot see or hear each other. If you run into any audio problems, please try logging in again with the link that you received in the email. And if that is still a problem, you can use a phone to call in to listen to the webinar. And don't worry, it's a local phone number, so you're not making an international call. If you have any questions, please use the question tab, which you can find on the right side of your GoToWebinar menu to ask us questions. It can be technical questions. You can share compliments if you want. And you can obviously ask questions about the webinar itself. We have a team behind the screens that is waiting, ready and waiting to take your questions and answer them as quickly as possible. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar. We have two Q&A sessions and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. We are going to run, I want to say a couple of polls, but we're actually going to run, I think, just one poll because we have a lot of information to share with you today. So we're keeping it very short, just one poll to test if everything is working correctly. I will launch that in a second. Um, and we're basically using that poll to get a little more information about you, whether you are exporting to Europe already. We are recording the session, so in case you run into technical issues or in case you, you have to leave early or you cannot say, uh, or you cannot hear us or any, any other issues, we're recording the session. So you're going to receive a link at the end of the webinar in an email with the presentation, with a recording of the presentation, as well as a link to the market study about specialty rights. So don't worry, you're not going to miss anything. So as I said, this webinar is based on our market study, uh, specialty rights, exporting specialty rights to Europe. And it is available on the CBI website, and we will be showing you at the end of the webinar where exactly to find it. But you'll also receive it in the email, as I said. So I'm going to launch a very quick poll to see if everything is working correctly. And I'm going to ask you whether or not you're already exporting to Europe. Would you please fill in the poll? OK. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of results coming in. I'm going to leave it open for just a few more seconds to give those who haven't voted yet an opportunity to vote. And right now about 78%, 80% of our attendees have voted. Okay, closing it down in five, two, one. Thank you for voting, and these are the results. As you can see, most of our attendees have not yet started exporting to Europe, so we hope this webinar is going to be very interesting for you today, and we're definitely going to be sharing some information about that. So as I said, we are talking about specialty rice today. We're going to tell you about the market potential, we are going to be sharing information about the latest consumer and buyer trends and be paying particular attention to the legal requirements, the EU requirements that you need to comply with if you want to export to Europe. We'll also show you how the market is developing in the most important export markets, basically the most interesting countries to export to, and tell you where the biggest opportunities are located. We are also going to be hearing directly from the sustainable rice platform that is very much 
focused on increasing the market share of sustainable rice in Europe. And they are going to be sharing some very interesting information as well about the practical aspects of exporting specialty rice, sustainable rice, particularly to Europe. Please feel free to ask your questions. And I am going to invite Arta from CBI to step up and welcome our attendees. Hello, Arta. Hi, good morning, Tonia. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take the presenter rights and share one slide with everybody. So if my slide is on, I would like to say on behalf of uh, CBI, good morning to all participants, uh, at least to those participants from Europe and from Africa, and good afternoon to all our participants located in Asia. Uh, let me start by thanking all of you for joining us today. Um, I'd like to send out a special welcome to the many uh, private and public sector partners that have shared the invitation to this webinar among their members. And of course, a very warm welcome to you as well, the many exporting companies joining us today. So I checked uh, registration this morning um, to this panel discussion and I saw we have many uh, exporters from producing countries in Asia with us today. Most notably, we have many participants from Pakistan, from India, from Indonesia. Uh, that are well represented, but uh, I also saw many other sources from Asia as well. And furthermore, um, interesting to see there's quite some African entrepreneurs with us as well, particularly from source countries like Nigeria and Kenya. Um, for the people that uh, do not know me, uh, my name is uh, Arthur Scheinert, and as program manager, I am responsible for CBI's market research in the sector of grains, pulses, and oil seeds. Um, and for listeners completely new to CBI, let me shortly introduce to you who we are and what we do. So as you can see on the slide, CBI is an abbreviation that stands for the Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. Um, we are a Dutch uh, government organization funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it is our mission to connect small and medium-sized enterprises like yourself to the European market and to create sustainable and inclusive economic growth. Um, the way we do this is by strengthening the sustainability of SMEs in developing countries. And we encourage exports of value added products to Europe and to the local region where you are based. Um, we help with finding practical solutions to bottlenecks in the export value chain. And one such bottleneck is limited access to market information. And this brings me um, to the goal of today's session. Um, we are, uh, in particular, these last three months of the years, uh, organizing a number of sessions about Europe's export potential. And today's focus, as you've seen, is on the grain sector. And together with a panel of experts that will be introduced to you shortly, we will explore the export potential of specialty rice. So in short, why do we do this? The uh, main reason is transfer of knowledge. So at CBI, we do a lot of research and we have many experts working for us that coach companies on a daily basis. And with these webinars, we ask them to share their best tips and practical advice with you. And we hope that today's discussion will give you new ideas, inspiration, and it will help you to take steps to improve and prepare your business for your next export success. I wish you all a very good session. Back to you, Tonia. Thank you, Arta. And I would now like to invite our experts to turn on their cameras. Thank you. And first up, I'd like to introduce Michel Paperkamp. Michel is the director of ICI Business, and he is a market research expert who is joining us from Voorburg in the Netherlands. Michel, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Michel Paperkamp. Um, I've been working uh, as a market, uh, market intelligence uh, expert as well as uh, expert consultant. So I basically help. Uh, to get the right information for companies that want to do business in Europe um, and uh, try to connect them to uh, potential uh, partners and uh, potential clients. Um, I've done this in the grains and pulses sector for the last uh, decade or so. Um, and for well, uh, multiple years, I've worked together with the CBI, uh, basically on the same, uh, on the same uh, subject. So that's me. Okay, welcome. Glad to have you. And next up Thank we you. have Wynne Ellis. Wynne is the director of the Sustainable Rice Platform. 
And the Sustainable Rice Platform is a multi-stakeholder alliance with over 100 members from the public, private sectors, the NGOs, research and financial institutions that seeks to transform the global rice sector. That's quite an ambition. When you're joining us from Bangkok, welcome. Can you tell us what do we need to know about you? Well, thank you and good good morning, everybody. Um, I think you've said it all really, but I'm the, I'm the executive director of the Sustainable Rice Platform. I've been in Asia now for 40 years. So this is my home um, uh, here in Thailand. Um, I've worked uh, for the last uh, eight years in this role. Um, so I've helped um, the SRP grow from a small coalition to its current status. Um, I've worked also for the multilaterals, for the, for the UN organizations and GIZ in the past, as well as for private companies. So it's a fairly um, broad organizational exposure that I, I bring to the table, I guess. Thank you. We're very much looking forward to what you're going to tell us today. Welcome. And our third expert today is Mr. Job Blom, joining us from Noordwijk in the Netherlands. And Job is the founding partner of Behold and a social entrepreneur with over 20 years of international experience in social and green entrepreneurship, as well as corporate social responsibility. Job, what can you tell us? Your sound is unfortunately off, uh, Job. Can you give it a try? It should be working now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's working now. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, a sustainable entrepreneur for over 20 years, having supported many uh, corporates, NGOs and governments on sustainable entrepreneurship, sustainable topics. Also working for over 20, 10 years for CBI as a branding consultant and export marketing consultant. And in that role, I also started to support the sustainable rice platform to also get positioned on the European market and also see if we can engage European retail and brands and downstream rice actors to promote and uh, procure uh, sustainable rice. So I will share a bit of that experience in the presentation later. Yeah, and you're going to be sharing some information about a market study that you did on behalf of with uh, the sustainable rice platform and would, it's, it contains a lot of interesting information. We're definitely looking forward to that. Uh, thank you very much. I would now like to transfer the presentation rights to Michelle Paperkamp, who will be taking us along and sharing some information about exporting specialty rice to Europe. Michelle, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me see if I can show my screen. Uh, it should be visible. Um, so yes, um, today we'll talk a little bit about the uh, the market uh, of uh, of specialty rice, um, starting with uh, with the definition of specialty rice, um, because it's it's it can include a lot of different uh, rice varieties, of course. Um, for our focus, we we focused on on, on a couple of uh, different rices. Uh, basically, you can you can say rice with a with a differentiated characteristic, um, which is different from 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 common common white rice. Uh, can be a specialty rice. Uh, this includes aromatic rice, uh, colored rice, um, or even rice from a specific origin, uh, like here in Europe and in, in Italy we have arborio rice, and in Spain we have bomba rice, um, and these uh, actually have. Uh, uh, specific uh, symbol that it is from that origin uh, which makes it uh, well, a different rice than, than, than other rices um, but you can also include uh, organic and fair trade uh, rice um, which are uh, labels that, that are also increasing in, uh, in its uh, market value um, so the definition is quite wide um, but we will start with a general market uh, outlook uh, for rice. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the, at, the, at the global rice market in Europe, you can see that um, that production in in Europe it's it's already quite quite big, but it's not that much increasing. It's actually decreasing a little bit. Um, at the moment, Europe is producing around uh, 1.7 million tons. 
most of this is from the uh, Japonica variety. Um, so uh, if you look at the graph, you can see at the same time that imports uh, are expected to increase uh, in, the, in the next 10 years uh, or nine years, I, I, I should say. Um, so this is, <clears throat> sorry, this is, uh, this is mainly import of, of Indica rice, which is uh, exactly the other, the other variety of rice. Uh, currently, it's 1.8 million tons, uh, but the demand in Europe will probably grow in the next 10 years with about 250,000 tons. Um, so you could say there is a growing market and there is more demand for, for imports. Um, you can consider the European market not as a big consumer of rice uh, if you compare it to the world. Uh, we average uh, at around six kilos per, per capita per year. Uh, which is, well, it's just nearly nothing if you compare it to the rest of the world, which is at 40, uh, 54 kilos uh, per capita. Um, there's also a division, of course, between the north and the south of Europe. Uh, most production takes place in the south, uh, so Italy, Spain, uh, and you can see that the consumption is much higher there than it is in northern Europe. Um, but then again, most imports uh, uh, end up in, in Northern Europe uh, for, for, for rice consumers. Um, so this is a general outlook. Um, if you look at the, um, the division of uh, husk rice or brown rice and uh, milled rice, which is white rice, um, you can see for both categories there is a growth. Um, especially in the, in the last year or the last two years, um, which may have, have something to do, of course, with, with the whole uh, pandemic uh, uh, and increasing demand for, uh, for easy and uh, fruits with a good shelf life. Um, <clears throat> so part of, part of these, um, part of, part of these uh, volumes, uh, you can say, are uh, aromatic rice, colored rice varieties. Uh, and these mainly come from Asian countries uh, at the moment. Um, Asia is of course one of the bigger or, or the biggest supplier of rice to, to Europe. Um, and if you look at the, uh, at the husk or brown rice, uh, a large share of this rice, um, you can expect to be basmati rice. Basmati is one of the, the, the biggest um, specialty wise, so to say, uh, that is in demand in, in Europe. Uh, another thing I think it's important to see is uh, the, the specific opportunities also for specific countries that are favorable trade tariffs. Um, so Basmati is one of the, uh, one of the varieties uh, from India and Pakistan that are exempted for, uh, from import duties, uh, so you can export duty free uh, Hust but basmati rice to to Europe for at least a certain uh, certain type of varieties I will get into later. Um, but also the least developed countries uh, in the world, uh, members of the CARI Forum, uh, and the overseas countries and territories of of the of the European Union. Those are all regions that are able to export uh, rice duty free to to Europe. So that will definitely give them them uh, an advantage. Um, there's not much information, uh, or at least not much data on specialty rice. Um, the only data that is, that is quite clear is, is from Basmati, uh, like I said, one of the most popular specialty rice. Um, and there you can see that uh, there is a growth uh, for, the la for the past uh, three years. Um, I must say in the, in the latest data, uh, the data of the United Kingdom is not complete. Um, so it says 337,000, but um, if, if you calculate it well, it, it should be approaching about 400,000 tons uh, for the European Union, including uh, the United Kingdom. Um, so, so here you can see actually there's a, there's a greater demand for, for this, this specialty rice, um, which is, uh, uh, well, in this case, and particular, particularly interesting for Pakistan and India, which are the, the only suppliers of, 
uh, of basmati rice um which at least you can see that that there's a there's a growing demand for them um so we're going into the trends uh there are several trends that that may provide opportunities for specialty rice as well um and then we i think we have to go back a little bit in time uh in europe because rice is not it's not one of the most traditional foods in europe of course um there's production in the south but uh in general terms rice got introduced over over the years uh in the last uh, century uh, and that was that was mainly because of traditional typical traditional foods from uh, people uh from uh, other countries than europe that brought their foods to europe um so we can see a couple of uh, typical dishes in italy and spain of course you have paella you have uh, risotto rice in, in in italy um these are typical dishes but there are many more rice dishes that came from abroad you see a picture of sushi here but there, there are so many more um curry from from india with rice thai rice um, so all these influences uh, they increase the consumption of rice in in Europe as well as specialty rice, um, and this will uh, this will continue to do so. Um, so the the rice varieties that you see now are, are really a niche variety, or maybe only consumed in the ethnic market. Um, also, these rice varieties have potential to to become a mainstream rice. Uh, as long as they are adopted by the by the majority, of course, of the uh, of the European people. So going to the next trends, uh, health, of course, is always a, a big trend in um, in food, um, and this translates, for example, also in uh, in a high percentage of organic uh, food. Um, and organic, I think, is a, is an important um, important label for for healthy. Uh, rice varieties. Um, the the number or the or the or the um, the volume that varies quite a quite a bit. Um, the number, the latest numbers, uh, two hundred sixty thousand tons of organic rice in two thousand eighteen, and only seventy one thousand in two thousand nineteen. It seems to fluctuate a lot, um, but most importantly is to remember that it is a market that is increasing. On an annual basis. So basically, the organic food market increased 8% in 2019, and it is expect, expected to continue to, to grow. Uh, at the moment, for organic rice, 61% uh, comes from, from India and Pakistan. Um, so they, they have a, a, a big uh, part of the, uh, of the organic supply. Um, another type of rice that you could say is uh, is considered as a healthy rice is whole grain rice. Um, if you look at the whole grain consumption, then uh, countries like Germany, the Netherlands, the Nordics, uh, so Scandinavia, uh, they have a quite quite a high whole grain uh, intake. Um, so that those could be countries as well uh, that are good to uh, to export uh, brown rice to. Um, next trend, I would say, uh, is still a niche, uh, which is fair trade rice. Um, according to Fair Trade International, there were about 55,000 tons of fair trade rice in, in 2019. Um, I think in Europe, of course, it's, this is a global number, so in Europe the, the number is, is quite a bit less, uh, but still it can be a quite interesting niche. Um, you see in the in the pictures a couple of uh, examples of uh, of fair trade rice. Um, it's uh, recognizable for consumers. Consumers can see it's uh, it's it's fair trade, um, and to an increasing number of consumers, it's something that that is that is appealing. Um, so that's a uh, that's another trend I would like to mention. And of course, uh, sustainability, uh, which uh, is for for now you can say uh, it's it, it's a trend with uh, with um, uh, um it's 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 it, well sorry <laughs> it's a trend that 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 is now now something something that is that is still niche but it will become a norm in the future I think. Um, Rice is responsible for uh, 
10 to 10 to 12 percent of the global methane emissions by humans uh, but it's also using 30 to 40 percent of world's fresh water so basically this is this is this is quite huge um, and sustainable rice is definitely the answer to uh, uh, to attack these um, uh, this, these unsustainable practices uh, and one of these um, sustainable uh, solutions that's a sustainable rice platform which is the world's first uh, st uh, voluntary standard for sustainable rice cultivation um, and I think uh, the next uh, speaker will definitely uh, speak a lot more about about this uh, this platform that may become the next uh, norm in the in the future Thank you very much, uh, Michel. And we are now going to invite Mr. Wynne Ellis to come online and um, tell us a bit more about the Sustainable Rice Platform. Let me share my screen. I don't see, okay, right. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, Tonya, um, and good day, everyone, once again. Um, delighted to be here. So a big thank you to CBI for the opportunity to be here and to share with you um, some of the work that we're doing and, under the Sustainable Rice Platform. I will be followed by my colleague, uh, uh, Jop, um, in due course, who will be speaking more about market uh, aspects and the prognosis for um, growth of sustainable rice to become the norm, if you like, uh, in the market. Um, but I'll be focusing really on how the sustainable rice uh, platform has emerged and how, what is our approach and how it can help you as exporters create, if you like, or, ex or, or make use of a new and differentiated market segment in Europe, which is growing pretty fast. So let me crack on quickly. I, I've had warnings from, from Tonya that, that I must stick to my time, so I'll try and be very quick. So please um, bear with me. Um, Basically, our aim is to um, transform the global rice sector. Um, we, okay, so just a few um, comments on rice and its criticality in the global food system. It's incredible that rice has been neglected in the sustainability stakes, in my view, compared with other crops, bearing in mind that around half the world depends upon rice for its caloric intake, and a billion, farm, a billion farmers depend on it for their livelihoods. And in, by 2050, we are going to need about 25% more rice and be able to have to produce that on a, on a finite resource base. Here you see um, some quite interesting um, statistics. Oh, what happened? Are you able to see my screen? Yes, okay. Um, what you see here is, is um, some uh, examples of, of footprints of different commodity crops. So as we know, sustainability initiatives are quite mature for these crops such as cocoa, oil palm, and so on, and tea, coffee. Um, rice was nowhere to be seen. And yet what you see here is, is, is an example of how the global footprint of rice dwarfs that of the other crops that have, that have achieved such prominence and have driven such de debate in the global sustainability uh, sphere. Um, Rice is a very thirsty crop, it has huge sustainability challenges, and it's also very vulnerable, um, because, particularly in, in the deltaic areas of Asia, where climate change is having a, an incredibly disruptive effect on production. Um, emissions, we've been hearing about um, in COP26, for the very first time, rice has actually emerged on the agenda and been, and been you know, called out as a source of around about 10% of global man-made methane emissions. And it's the first time that rice um, has been called out in this way. So I think it's it's important that we see that recognition growing and um, we're, we're, we're pleased to see this happening. Um, so again, um, the challenge is how to meet future rice demand um, and improve the lives of farmers and the environment while we're doing it. Uh, and also, of course, to protect biodiversity and increase the resilience of um, uh, rice farmers uh, in, in producing countries. So SRP was set up really with the goal to feed the world sustainably, to transform the global rice sector. It is a global alliance convened by UNEP, uh, GIZ, IRI, and private sector partners. When I joined, we had, I think, 12 um, 
uh, organizations around the table. So now we're 103, something like that. And we are registered in Germany as a not-for-profit association. Um, as you see, there are, okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. So, you know, these are some of our members. That's not all of them, but you'll see some very familiar uh, logos there covering roughly, um, I, I'd say, you know, an even coverage of the stakeholder spectrum. This is very important for us because it means that what we do is supported and uh, driven by consensus across the different stakeholder actors. And that gives us some confidence, it gives us some robustness in the, in the uh, quality and pra pra practicality, workability of what we do. Um, um, some of the tools, basic tools that we've developed as a foundation for our work, as, as we heard earlier on um, uh, from Michelle, we launched the for world's first definition of working definition of sustainability in the rice sector in 2015. We're now in the second edition. Um, basically, this, um, unlike other standards, we, we've learned, I think, from other standards, not only do we define a set of sustainable climate smart best practice in the form of the standard, but we support that by having a set of performance indicators so we can actually measure the impact of adoption. So it's a, a framework for uh, improvement as well as just compliance. Um, and we tested out um, the standard in uh, implementation in 13 countries between 2016 and 2017. What was really impressive is that across these very different production contexts from Pakistan to, South, to Southeast Asia and a couple of countries in Africa as well, we were seeing, seeing more or less the same kinds of benefits. 20% savings in water use, reductions in chemical use, a boost in incomes. And so whilst these aren't peer reviewed, um, because they're happening across such a broad range of production contexts, we have confidence that you know, we are doing some good here. Um, these are the countries where we worked in originally. Um, basically, we are doing two things. We're working in the, in, through market uh, value chain initiatives, which we'll talk more about shortly, and also driving scale through development partnerships. And, and this probably is going to achieve you know, a far, far greater development impact when we talk about the SDGs and so on than, than perhaps market initiatives. But market initiatives are vital. Um, we are building capacity through our training programs um, and also facilitating South-South knowledge exchange, for example, between Asia and Africa, where we are focusing a lot of attention now through GIZ's uh, Competitive African Rice Initiative. And there is a large program now being organized through ECOWAS called the Rice Observatory that will facilitate rollout. So we, we're seeing quite some traction, quite some interest amongst different actors in adopting SRP as their vehicle for change, if you like. Um, okay, we've already covered this um, uh, benefit, so I'll skip through that quickly. Now comes, I think, what perhaps will interest you most as exporters. Uh, based on the standard, we have developed an assurance scheme which is which is managed by Global Gap. Um, it is based on the based on the standard, and we launched basically um, the SRP verified on pack label last September. Um, and it is it is being uh, launched in, in, well, it's available now in supermarket uh, shelves in Germany, in the Netherlands, uh, in Italy, and I think a couple of other countries, but it's, it's actually gaining traction quite rapidly. Um, what it can do is for a downstream actor, it de-risks the supply chain for um, exporters and suppliers it helps them supply um, uh, according to uh, procurement specifications that are more and more now starting to prescribe sustainable rice uh, according to SRP as, their as one of the uh, tendering requirements. So that is coming down the pipe and you will, you will see quite soon those uh, SRP requirements reflected in, 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 in tender documents. So it's a chance. It's a chance, I think, to to start to align with a, a new reality among downstream actors that will focus much more on sustainability in in rice in rice uh, procurement. So um, this has been quite interesting. Um, there's also been a, a retail premium, uh, you know, being paid being paid for sustainable rice in the market. We'll hear more about that from from Drop uh, so quite soon. Um, just some examples of some labels in the market. These are from Germany. Um, and um, 
then finally, um, just to say, well, not just are we, not only are we working in the private sector driving value, driving private sector market value chains, but we're also expanding the production base through multilateral uh, initiatives with various strategic partners, UN, um, international rice research institutes, and so on, and also through um, financial instruments. And these also may, may be of interest to you because as SRP members, you might be able to avail yourself and participate in these programs, and you're most welcome to do so. So we've just won with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. It was announced last night, actually, at COP26, um, the Adaptation Challenge Grant to establish sustainable rice financing facilities in three countries in Asia, provisionally Bangladesh, um, Cambodia, and Vietnam, but that is subject to change. But um, these will help to address the pinch points in financing um, sustainable rice production in these countries. We plan to expand that way beyond those three countries, of course. So um, that gives you an idea of how we intend to scale up um, the production base for sustainable rice um, in Asia and in Africa, actually. That's it. Um, so thank you very much. We'll, I'm, very, I'm very open to questions. Um, uh, when the time comes, but I think I'm going to hand back to the moderator right now uh, to continue with the next presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that win, and we are definitely looking forward to uh, hearing more about what the Sustainable Rice Platform can do for exporters in developing countries. Um, I'd like to welcome Yop. I see you're already online. Welcome. And Job, uh, I'm going to be moving your slides forward. So the first slide is up and I would like to invite you to kick off your presentation. Your sound is still off. Just one second. I'm going to see if I can rectify that. You should be on. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wynn, also for the introduction. Uh, as said, uh, I'm supporting SRP with retail and brand engagement. So we try to do um, get um, sustainable rice mainstream in Europe, which is actually quite new. So we really had to get started from the beginning, from nothing. Also creating awareness about sustainable rice and what it is to be sustainable rice and what the benefits of sustainable rice is and also put it more top of mind with uh, retail and brands in Europe. Next slide. <clears throat> so that was the objective and we are this is next to that we want to create this awareness also for the consumers. We really uh, want to create relationships also focusing on retail and brands, but with that also push more pressure on traders, on millers, on exporters to actually also supply uh, sustainable rice to them all with the benefits to support 1 million smallholder farmers in 2025 while minimizing the environmental impact of rice production. Next slide. So we started actually to start mapping um, uh, the landscape, the retail landscape, in that you can see that also similar actually to the study of Michel, we came out that Northwestern Europe is our most, most uh, biggest target group also because of uh, purchase power, but also because of their sensitivity for uh, sustainability as well as uh, more uh, capa capacity to also pay for sustainable rice. And we actually started to map like, okay, what kind of, how many chains, how many supermarket chains are there in the UK, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, Belgium and France, which are a bit like our target uh, priority markets and then of course also Scandinavia is also very sensitive towards sustainability and they have a good purchasing power so we also included them as well as Switzerland, Austria and Ireland so really like a very detailed approach to look for our markets. Next slide and in those markets we were looking like okay which one are the sustainability leaders we, and also where do we have the right context who can we create ambassadors for? So in that sense, you see that we started to target plus Netherlands, Tesco UK already a member. So if you can only convince Tesco, you can imagine the purchasing power or the volumes that you can create if they are starting to move 
towards sustainable rice. So here you see a bit of like overview of all the stores that they have in Europe. So also why we are targeting this uh, target group. And in that, for example, is also Lidl Germany, who now started to sell in over 11,200 stores. In, um, uh, and they, they started now in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Denmark and in Germany. So with that, we can have like a lot of like uh, visibility of the brand, but also availability of sustainable rice. So that is really how detailed we work. Uh, next slide. And also, of course, like sustainability is a mantra for both the retailers as well as consumers. You know, it was already 85% thought it was a priority and 92% of the retailers ex actually expect sales in sustainable products to increase in the next five years. So it's really like top of mind. I'm already in sustainability uh, since uh, 2000, 1998 actually, and it now really becomes the norm. Next slide. And that is also driven, of course, by the consumers, by conscious consuming. You see this growing market trends. It is in sustainability. It is in, in your packaging. It is in reducing your environmental footprint, your CO2 emissions. It is about certification quality standards. More and more people are becoming vegan. It was actually one of the largest uh, growing uh, populations in, in, in Europe at the moment. Uh, of course, also very interesting for the rice product uh, combined with the healthy living and the healthy diets that people are looking for. And that also fits very good, as Michelle already explained. And uh, people are looking for fair trade, for more transparency. So there will be a lot of like interesting developments, I think, in blockchain to come in the months to come. It's very popular. It's very top of mind and also now more and more uh, uh, brands and retailers are also experimenting with QR codes that you can actually see the whole journey from farm to fork at your packaging. So QR codes will also be very present, I think, in the next years to come and combined with also blockchain. And um, there is, of course, also the convenience, especially also now with COVID, as we saw people who were more living at home, also ordering more. Uh, at home. So if we can convince, for example, HelloFresh to also start procuring sustainable rice, we can have immediately a huge volume of sustainable rice in the market. Uh, a, a bit of a threat could be global versus local that, of course, uh, European consumers are more and more focusing also to procure their products locally. Next slide. So as uh, Win already said, we are gaining momentum. A big breakthrough was, of course, Lidl and Riso Cayo. They also started to um, in, uh, 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 do uh, sustainable verified rice. Interesting thing about the price, because people always think like sustainability is uh, expensive. Uh, interesting thing is that we compared the Albert Heijn prices and that actually Lidl uh, SOP verified rice is, is, is also cheaper in the market. So in that sense, they also want to break this trend and this perception of that sustainability also always have to be more expensive. Um, our job was also to create awareness around it. So we were very happy to be on the new Pintanel uh, leading news platform with the introduction of sustainable rice. We have more and more articles coming up. And it was even featured as one as the 10 food trends for this year and um, being sustainable rice. So really trying also to educate the consumer and with that put also more pressure on retail. It's always like a chicken and egg discussion, but uh, you have to, I think, both focus on convincing B2B as well as B2C in your, um, in your um, uh, achievements. Next slide. So what we also did was a survey. This is maybe not an academic survey. Uh, we sent it out to, I think, uh, around 350 contacts. Of that, we had like uh, almost 10% to complete the form. But the ones who completed it were very representative for the sector because it were traders, it were importers, it were brands, retailers, producers, exporters. So we had a really nice combination of people that completed our survey which we conducted uh, this summer. 
And in this, you see a stunning 90% of respondents that view sustainable rice sourcing as a priority. So it, it's proving actually what we say. And of that, it's almost 50% that will expect that it will grow from 30 to 70% of the market share so huge numbers are coming up and we really believe that it will become the norm next slide some i will give some examples of the survey that we did uh, so they really see it the priority as you see in this slide uh, almost no one is seeing it not as a priority to start sustainable procurement next slide then we have the current procurement that people are actually already starting to pave the path. So 70% uh, is already working with sustainable rice. So there's already uh, a good basic market and uh, consciousness and awareness and also procurement skills from the companies and the traders and the millers and the retailers and the brands and all their downstream rice actors that are already uh, procuring it. Next slide. But what you see is that they are currently only procuring like less than 15%, the majority of it. So there's still a market to gain, uh, so to say. Uh, next slide. And what you see is that everybody sees uh, sustainable sourcing as a priority with over 80%, like seeing it, it's like a highest priority. So, and no one is saying that it's not a priority so it's it's top of mind it's top on the agenda it, it is there to to really change and flow in the in the very near future next slide uh, so that's also what you see they expect also to source higher volumes uh, most uh, what you see on the right hand uh, 33 percent of the respondents which is the highest number of the respondents actually expect to source a volume of more than 70% of sustainable rice by 2025. So that is actually up to you to be prepared to also transform your production into sustainable rice. And the nice thing what uh, Win actually didn't tell is that transformation can be gradual. So you can start immediately. It's not like with organic that you have to transform your industry or your production in three years time no it's like a really like a growing model so you can start from day one and it's sustainable rice is also with the srp it's not about certification but it's about verification so that makes it actually easier for you as a producer to start with the srp guidelines and to implement that in your good farming practices next slide uh, what are the motivations for companies? Consumer sustainability interest that is increasing, reputation and business potential, so they really see it as new markets and to serve the new markets of conscious consumers, which is ever growing on a yearly basis. But actually also it's in their company sustainability policy, uh, Paris agreements, COP26 that we now see, all the companies have actually higher standards to meet the goals in CO2 reduction, in climate uh, mitigation uh, standards. So everybody is having it in their core strategy. And with the retailers then, they will put it in the tenders to the traders, to the distributors, to the millers, uh, that they will want to have sustainable rise. So then also the traders and the millers and other actors will have to follow that system sustainability policy of the retailers. Upcoming legislation was actually not one of the main re, uh, motivation, but of course European legislation is becoming more and more sensible and strict about sustainability. Next slide. So what are the obstacles? We also ask them, and that is really that people are afraid that there's not enough supply. So that is really where you come in. So we really advise you also to become a member of SRP to also maybe become a member of the rice exchange which has like a good platform for to match demand and supply uh, to find your clients there and uh, really start uh, making sure that we can meet this future demand and also people are uh, a bit afraid of the high prices that will come in but I think when the market will adapt to it 
the high prices are yet to be seen. I think we can create lots of economies of skills. Next slide. So what are the areas of focus which they think are interesting? Of course, it's about boosting smallholder farmers' incomes. That's always very relevant. But really, people are very uh, supporting the fact that it's protecting the environment, better land use, biodiversity, uh, better water ma management, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and creating climate change resilience. So, top of the agenda. Next slide. And then I'm almost there. And then we also ask them because always the perception is that sustainability is more expensive because you have to put more measures in, you have to do your verification, you have to um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, adapt to it. It's, 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 uh, and especially as we work with smallholder farmers. Uh, we ask the industry, in your opinion, what percentage of companies are prepared to pay a premium for sustainable rice? And in that, you see that 40% think that consumers would be willing to pay a low premium for sustainable rice if needed. So there is this willingness. And that, that is also proven by many other reports that are out there in the market. We had done a, a very uh, uh, profound market study on that as well. Next slide. So what we expect, and this is really like not from an expert in the market at all, but based on our discussions that we had with retail, that we had with survey, that we had with a focus group, that we had with market reports also provided by CBI. We actually think that just like bananas, coffee, etc., cetera, we, we expected sustainable rice to become the norm. And we are that bold to dare to say that we expect the European retail demand for sustainable rice in 2025 is to double. And that's also what we have been discussing with some traders, with some retailers, with uh, other actors. And with the market potential market share of 50% of the rice, and then maybe, maybe talking about Maspati, will be sustainable rice. So high numbers, so all be prepared. And we are happy to support you also in SRP to make sure that you can meet that future demand. Next slide, which is also the final slide of my presentation. Here you also see the contact details, always happy to connect. And we are also working with the team on it. So together with my colleagues, Nick Joost and Leon Trujillo. And we also advise you to follow social media on SRP. On LinkedIn, we are very active. On Facebook, we are very active. And on all the other channels. So please uh, follow us there as well. Thank you, Tonya. Thank you very much, Job. And uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I would like to invite uh, Michelle and Wynn to join us as well. And Job, I'm going to kick off with a very quick question to you. What is the difference between sustainable rice and fair trade rice? Now, the sustainable rice is actually a combination of the two. Like fair trade is, of course, more focusing on income uh, by the farmers and the livelihoods of the farmers, and of course, also a little bit on sustainability. Organic is, of course, completely focusing on the sustainability aspects, uh, less um, chemical use, less water use, climate resilience, all those kind of uh, factors. And actually, the nice and interesting aspect of sustainable rice platform is that they try to combine these two factors. I think it's on measuring on over 40 criteria, both combining the environmental impact as well as the social impact of rice procurement. And, and that's also interesting what, what Win already said, like uh, 3.5 billion people depend on it for their daily meal. Billions of people are active in the rice industry uh, from far to fork. 140 smallholder farmers, million smallholder farmers are active with it. So it's a huge, it, it's such a huge impact and, and so much more than coffee, cacao and other sectors. So of that, it's so, it's, a, it's of yeah, tremendous importance for yeah. sustainability and uh, social impact that can be created for farmers and people working in the industry. 
Okay, and um, when when just just one second, uh, because I forgot to tell our, our audience that we've moved to the Q and A session, to the first Q and A session. So uh, to our attendees, we have a lot of questions already coming in, and we'll do our best to answer them. Please send in your questions so we can um, so we can try to answer as many as possible. Win over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tanya. Just to add to um, uh, Yop's comments. Uh, we, we looked at a lot of voluntary standards and, and there was a trend in the 80s and 90s to focus on specific issues like mangroves or child labour in standards. Um, we wanted to move away from that because we thought that it was rather, um, we need to have, have a broader approach and to make sure that we were covering the broad range of issues that, um, um, that, that encompass, that are, that are inherent in sustainability. Um, including yeah, obviously um, uh, livelihoods of farmers, but also environmental and climate change, resource use, and so on. The challenge for us has to be has been to you know to, to cover these different areas, but also to have a standard that is pragmatic and compact enough to be uh, to, in order to be able to uh, implement cost effectively. I think there was a question about um, the cost of transition. There is no cost of transition, in fact, because farmers will save on input costs. Um, uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, and as, as Yop was also saying, in contrast to um, the transition period required for organic farmers, um, it's normally three years, where farmers bear a compliance burden but are unable to, 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 to secure premiums for their product. Um, with SRP, you can you can be certified in the first year of, in the first season of production. So that means that producers and exporters can be quite agile in meeting market needs. Thanks. Okay, that's very interesting. And when you have to leave us in a few minutes, so I'd like to put a couple of questions to you. Um, we have a question here from Heike, who says, if you have both certificates, fair trade and organic, what additional benefits does uh, sustainable rice uh, SRP have? Well, well it, it goes back to my earlier comment in, the, in that uh, a lot of a lot of these standards are really focused on on one particular aspect, uh, and this is this is good. I mean, I, I think it's it, it's it's important to be very focused in some ways. But you can be providing, for example, hypothetically, you can be providing a good income to farmers while still destroying the environment, <laughs> um, while still causing deforestation, and and there has and there, and, and this has happened. Um, not specifically with fair trade, but um, you know, you you get the picture. It's important to be holistic in your approach. Um, um, we have had discussions previously with iPhone in regard to joint certification, um, uh, uh, organic plus sustainability. What we find is that is that um, organic standards are very focused on um, you know uh, chemical usage or pro prohibition of chemical usage whilst sustainability standards generally um, have uh, a broader a coverage of uh, environmental and biodiversity um, criteria. So it broadens the scope of, um, let's say, an organic standard to cover more of the sustainability agenda than, than would be present in either an organic or a fair trade um, treatment. Okay, thank yeah, you. Maybe Maybe to add to that, it's it's also a multi-stakeholder platform for the entire industry. So it's not only about the certification, but also that you work united and hand in hand to really like with all the stakeholders, with all the actors in the entire industry to transform this industry. So there's the lobby, lobby the advocacy, the learning, the sharing of knowledge, the joint projects that you develop, the market linkages that can be made between like uh, suppliers and um, and demand. So in that sense, it's it's not only a certification as such. You know, it's it's like an industry movement that we want to create. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, when I think the time has come for you to leave us, or do you still have a few minutes? I still have a couple of minutes, actually. If you, if there are any more questions. Very happy there are a couple, to of, there are a couple yeah. of practical questions. So, a panel, I'm going to get to you because we're having a lot of questions coming in, actually. Uh, but I'm going to get to the rest of the panel, just quickly trying to get as much as possible out of Wynn before he leaves. Yeah. Wynn, um, what do you know about sustainable rise in the south of Brazil? 
I actually visited uh, Brazil um, last year. It was my last trip before um, COVID struck, in fact, um, and then, then I was grounded. And it was quite an incredible contrast to my, my experience in Asia, where the average farm size is one hectare. And we, were, we went to a farm and they, they told us this is the second largest farm in, in Brazil, and it was 10,000 hectares. Um, you know, so they're using pivot irrigation. Um, they're using, you know, very intensive mechanized production methods. Um, in general, um, uh, Brazilian farmers are extremely, um, uh, I think, compliant. They will, would be compliant with, with SRP standards pretty much. Um, there is a lot of interest in from Embrapa, the uh, uh, Brazilian uh, research agency, and also INIA, uh, the uh, sorry, INRA, the, the regional the regional research network um, in Latin America. We've done some training already for for um, uh, governmental uh, experts there. So we have we have some interest. We have not yet uh, secured commitments, but there's there, there's a lot of interest in exporting particularly from uh, from Brazil to to the states and also to Africa. Okay, thank you for that. That's very interesting. And Wynn, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you. We still have a number of questions that are focusing on sustainable rice. I hope Jop is going to be able to answer them. And if not, we will definitely share more information with our audience. Win, thank may you. I, may, I, yeah. sorry, may I just say that, you know, all, to all of the, uh, everyone who's who's listening here, you're most welcome to join the Sustainable Rice Platform and be part of this movement. So I'm sure Jop will, will answer further questions, but please don't hesitate to, to write to me. I think my email address is on the presentation. So thank you so much again for the opportunity. Bye-bye now. Very welcome, goodbye. We'll continue the Q&A with the rest of our panel and I'll let it go on for a couple more minutes um, before we move on to part two of our presentations. Michel, a question for you. What do you know about rice flour? Sure. Uh, well, I know it's not one of the, uh, the things we focused on in the, in the rice study, but um, well, if you talk about rice flour, you talk about um, you talk about, for example, rice noodles in Europe, um, uh, which is which is part of the the ethnic consumption, but also a quite popular product for 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 other consumers. So yeah, there's definitely uh, there's definitely demand for for rice flour. Um, another interesting part, I think, that could be in favor of rice flour is that it is a flour that is uh, gluten-free, uh, which is also addressing a number of consumers that are well that prefer a diet that is that is free of gluten. Um, so for baking, for other things, uh, all kinds of processing. So yes, I don't have the numbers ready because we didn't include it in the study, but. Um, there's, there's definitely uh, possibilities for, for rice flour in that, in that sense. Okay, interesting. And uh, a question for Job before we move on to part two of the webinar. And for our attendees, I know there are a lot of other questions. We're going to get back to them in the second Q&A, so don't worry if I haven't, if I haven't uh, addressed your question yet. Job, um, as for sustainable rice, uh, the graph showed a lack of demand as a major reason for retailers not showing interest. Would the demand be enough for a farmer association to adopt uh, sustainable rice? And can the sustainable rice platform help in connecting producers to buyers? Yeah, to answer your final question, yes. That is also part of like the, the role of the sustainable rice platform to make this market linkages. And um, demand is increasing so demand is and it's really like the chicken and egg discussion that we constantly also face with uh, retailers that they say okay if we have enough demand there's not enough supply or we don't have enough demand yet so we are not starting with the supply but all of them and the most of them that we have spoken to are now putting it in their tender requirements already that it has to be sustainable so that will shift very uh, fast, but we also have been talking a lot with the rice exchange and they actually face that they say that there's much more demand than supply at the moment via their platform. So they are, and that's where, where we are really pushing also uh, win to really upgrade uh, the supply because the demand is there already in Europe and it will only increase. So yeah, we, we expect it uh, to be there. 
Sounds like a fantastic market opportunity for exporters. And I think that's a fantastic segue to our next presentation from Michelle as well, who's going to be telling us about the countries that are most interesting for uh, exporters, as well as what to do in terms of market preparation and market entry. And Michelle, may I ask you to keep it brief? <laughs> I will try. I will put on my timer. <laughs> I'm making you so present. Let me, uh, please. I will show my screen, um, go to the first slide. There we are. Yeah, we start with, uh, with, uh, with the countries in Europe. Just a quick overview. Um, let me get to the next, yes. Um, so basically, if we look at Europe, uh, like I said, Northern Europe, it's, it's quite a big market for the import of rice. Uh, you see the United Kingdom is leading the way for brown rice imports. Well, part of it, of course, basmati rice, you can see below. It is, uh, the UK is the biggest import of basmati rice, um, followed by the Netherlands. Um, and if you look at milled rice imports, then France is quite a bit bigger. Um, and France is also a quite interesting country for organic. Um, it has the highest, consum rice, uh, the highest consumption per capita uh, for organic food. Um, and it has increased quite a bit for the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last years. Um, so France, Germany, uh, Italy, those are the countries that are uh, selling most organic food um, in general. In general. Um, of course, rice is, is, is part of, of that. Um, if you focus on the specific countries, let's start with the UK, which is probably one of the most interesting markets for rice. Um, it is, like I said, the largest uh, importer of basmati as well. Um, that uh, has to do some something with, of course, a, a big population of, uh, of Indian and Pakistani people that live in the UK, or throughout the UK. So there's a big ethnic market, but a lot, also a lot of influence from this population to uh, the rest of, of Britain uh, and British consumption. Um, organic is not that developed yet, if you compare it to the uh, to the more developed countries in or in organic in Europe. Um, but if you talk about ethical brands uh, and fair trade, uh, yes, there's definitely some some opportunities there. Uh, I added one example uh, of an ethical brand, which is Kilombero rice from, uh, from Malawi. Um, uh, if you look at the leading brands, uh, Ben's Original, uh, used to be named Uncle Ben's, they changed the name, uh, is one of the biggest brands. Uh, if you look at specialty rice, uh, then the brands like uh, Tilda, uh, Laila, uh, Koinor, those are those are brands that that, that present a lot of uh, varieties, uh, such as basmati, different types of of, of basmati as well. Um, so yeah, the UK is is definitely a, a, a good market to a good market to focus on. Um, going to the next market, France. Uh, France is uh, like I said, it's it, it's an important market for organic food, uh, so also organic rice. Um, France, uh, in France, what, what may be a bit different is that local definitely matters. Um, I think French people are, are a bit more uh, focused on, on, their, on, their, well, on their local food production. Uh, there is also some rice production. Uh, they have their own variety. Um, and also here you see that about 19% is actually from organic agriculture. Um, so. Uh, the rice production, of course, is, is by far not enough to, uh, to supply the whole market. Uh, and they do like uh, different types of rice as well, uh, including Thai rice, basmati rice, long grain, uh, risotto, like the more for it, more Italian dishes. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, uh, especially the milled rice import uh, is, um, is increasing. Um, yeah, uh, fair trade rice, of course, there are different uh, companies, Autour de uh, Derry uh, and Alter Eco, they, they have fair trade rice as well. Um, so those could be interesting niches. Um, 
Going next to Germany, Germany is more stable market. Um, it's a medium rise consumer with six kilos per capita, which is uh, quite average for Europe. Um, they mainly import milled rice, um, but also offer opportunities uh, for organic. Um, don't forget that Germany is, the, is one of the larger countries in Europe, uh, 80 uh, plus million. Um, Fair trade, interesting niche, but still a, a bit more than a, a thousand tons, 1200 tons in 2020. A um, few big uh, rice food companies, uh, Orisa and Ebro Foods, they have several rice brands that are active in, in German retail. Uh, but you can, you can find definitely specialty brands um, and ethnic rice. Uh, I included some of the, some of the shops uh some of the um, the buyers of, of these types of rice like trans foods uh, you can surf to the website and you can have a whole overview of what kind of rice they they are they are selling uh netherlands um netherlands used to have a few big companies in rice actually but uh, nowadays these are uh, now part of uh, multinational companies uh in spain and italy um uh, Lassi, which is a common brand here, uh, they go big on, on the, well, they call it Tover, Tover rice, which is magic, magic rice because it cooks so fast. Um, uh, we have Pandan rice, which is actually jasmine type uh, Thai rice. Um, and what you see in the Netherlands is, is quite a bit of growth, both for milled rice and brown rice. Um, so it's an interesting market to focus on, but also because it's not just for the Dutch market, it's also for re-export. The Netherlands is uh, a good hub to, uh, to re-export uh, different rice varieties to other European countries. Uh, so that's why there's a relatively large uh, number, uh, large amount of rice coming into the Netherlands as well. Um, of course, yeah, uh, we are the second importer of basmati, uh, 77,000 tons uh, in 2020, 2021, and still increasing as well. You can find several varieties at typical Asian shops in the Netherlands, or, uh, uh, or even ethnic, ethnic brands. Um, Belgium uh, is the third largest importer of brown rice. Um, there's a big miller, uh, of course, in Belgium, uh, which is also uh, the owner of Uncle Ben's, Ben's Original, uh, which is the Mars, Mars company. They mill a lot of, uh, a lot of rice, so there's, there's, a, there's a big import of brown rice uh, that is destined to this company. Um, you, see, you can also see some influences from the Netherlands. There are big retailers nowadays active in Belgium uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, so you can expect the same products to, to go there. Uh, and there's some French influence as well. So the French rice uh, that is produced in France, you, you, you will also uh, see in Belgium retailers. Um, going to Italy, the last, uh, the last country, uh, which is the largest rice uh, importer in south of Europe, but also the largest uh, producer of rice with 1.5 million tons, uh, more or less 900,000 900, tons milled rice. Um, so there's a, there's a big presence of milling companies. Uh, Euricom is one of the bigger ones. Um, this makes Italy an important country for, for rice imports. Uh, mainly medium long grain, uh, grain rice and, and, and japonica rice are more consumed in Italy, but the import from Indica is also, Indica rice is also in, increasing. Uh, so expect Italy to be both a buyer and a competitor because, because of course they have a lot of uh, their own rice varieties as well. Um, going first to the next part, uh, how to prepare for the European market. Um, so this is for, especially for the companies that are not yet active in Europe. Um, basically food safety is, is your most important objective. Um, if the rice that, you, that you're supplying does not comply with EU regulation, um, then forget, forget about exporting basically. Um, you need to comply with uh, residue levels uh, for, for, for pesticides and contaminants. 
Uh, and you need to make sure that your rice is completely traceable. If something uh, is wrong with the rice, we, of course, the authorities need to know where it came from and take action. Um, so hygiene, pesticides, contaminants, those are really important fo focus points. Um, residue limits for rice, uh, I can say that it's one of the strictest markets for pesticide residues. Uh, recently, we have tightened some of the uh, residue limits for, uh, if I pronounce it well, uh, tricyclazole and uh, buprofizen. Um, and uh, these cannot be found basically in, in the rice that you're supplying. The limit is so low that you know it, it shouldn't be it should be absent basically. Um, the same goes for organic rice. Um, organic rice when tested by laboratories in Europe, um, it should not show any chemical traces or at least be below uh, 0 0.01 milligrams per kilo. Um, yeah, then of course we have uh, the maximum levels of heavy met metals, uh, cadmium, arsenic is, uh, is of course uh, uh, an important uh, uh, an important heavy metal to take into account. Um, and these are the lim limits, 0.2 milligrams per kilo. Um, so to guarantee your buyer that you are compliant with, with EU regulations, um, it's best to have a, a quality management system uh, based on HACCP. Um, this is basically a, a basic requirement for in, in, in most foods, uh, food supply chains. Um, if you talk about agriculture, then global gap can also be a big advantage for producers, um, which is more focused on, on, uh, on good practices in, in the agricultural production. Uh, food, food safety management systems are, for example, BRC, uh, IFS, uh, and ISO uh, 22000. Uh, those are all based on HACCP uh, guidelines. Um, in Europe, we also have a uh, standard for rice. Um, Michel, sorry, you, you have about three more minutes. Okay, I will continue quickly then. Um, so the standard you can you can find back on the internet as well. Um, there's also a standard for basmati rice, uh, which is based on the UK Rice Association, which is common uh, to use throughout Europe as well. So what are buyers looking for? Uh, purity and cleanliness, uh, of course, uh, grain size, shape, integrity, color, texture, stickiness. Uh, these are all ways to uh, to put your rice apart for, uh, from the uh, from the um, well uh, from the common rice. Um, for specialty rice, it's also about consumer experience. So flavor, aroma, uh, nutritional value can also play a role. These are all things you can use to set your rice apart. Um, if you choose a variety, then uh, uh, there's, for example, for basmati, there are several varieties that are duty-free uh, imports in the EU. Um, I listed them here. Um, so with a certificate of authenticity, these are the basmati varieties that can enter the market duty free. And they all have different, uh, well, different tastes, different uh, consumer experience. Um, I would say super basmati, pusa, uh, kernel basmati are probably the biggest or the bigger ones. Um, Focus mostly on long grain, uh, uh, not parboiled. Uh, those are the the, the biggest uh, the biggest rice categories. So long grains uh, are uh, popular for imports. Uh, of course, organic. Make sure that organic is certified according to EU legislation, where, which is also uh, and which also has a new legislation coming in uh, starting uh, the first of January. It will be active. Um, and find a good certifier. Um, uh, I heard that last month there are several certifiers in India that got blacklisted. Um, and of course, that's, that's not convenient when you are uh, supplying organic rice because your organic rice will be sold as conventional rice. Um, and that will be a shame. It's not an easy uh, thing to um, uh, to require to organic, uh, organic um, legislation. Uh, so make sure you're able to uh, to complete this task before doing it. 
um, market entry. What are the options? Um, well, here you see a little bit the uh, different size of markets. Uh, Basmati is a big market, organic is a big market, uh, 300,000 tons. Uh, fair trade is a bit smaller. For a lot of rice varieties, we don't have really specific uh, data, uh, but of course, they, you can all find them in, in different niches. Um, mainstream specialties, I would say, uh, try to get the, uh, the main rice buyers. Uh, jasmine rice is, 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 a, is a big category, basmati rice, uh, sushi type rice. Uh, those are all rice that you can find with the biggest suppliers and the biggest buyers uh, because they're so common. Uh, I listed a couple of names. Uh, you can use brokers as well to get to, the, to these bigger names um, um, or well, importers that, that, focus, uh, that, uh, that focus on rice or, or, or input rice. Um, a couple of names are included in the slides. Uh, there's an eth ethnic segment which can be quite interesting uh, for really specific rice varieties. Uh, these, will, these will end up in restaurants, ethnic shops, specialized wholesalers. Um, so we talk about uh, Sona Masuri rice or, or Kalijira rice. Um, these are not common for the, for the average consumer in Europe, but they will be recognized by, of course, more ethnic consumers. Um, then we have prepacked rice. Uh, there is there could be a small opportunities for companies that are able to uh, pack rice and, and, and brand their own label. Uh, at the moment, you see, for example, the Indian LT Foods uh, with the brand Dawat. Uh, they have been quite successful in uh, in Europe with their brands. Uh, but this is not an easy step to take. You need to have a, a certain uh, volume, a certain uh, investment power to realize and a market a brand because it will be a big, big investment. Um, but yeah, it's it's another market segment, uh, segment I would not like to skip. Um, and then of course specialty, uh, social, sustainable wise. You talked about it quite a lot. Um, I think fair trade is a niche which is growing. You see a couple of names, uh, but you also see that a lot of fair trade at the same time is also organic. Um, so um, if, if you focus on, on fair trade, maybe it's a good idea to, to, uh, to certify organic as well. Um, and then we talked about SRP. Um, I think the interesting part of SRP, which is still of course starting uh, uh, at the moment. Um, uh, I think the interesting thing there is that it's really focused on, on rice. So it's a, it's a really specific label for rice. And for organic, of, of course, you have uh, uh, well, the, the same standards go for, for rice as just for any other food product. Um, so yeah, SAP has a lot of uh, potential for, for growth and, uh, in the future. Um, last slides. Um, so your market entry strategy, um, I would suggest to really define your uniqueness. Uh, look at your soil, your climate, the variety that you are producing, certifications. What makes your product different from them than all the other suppliers? That's really an important step uh, to, to start with. Um, then be sure that you are able to supply a grain that is reliable in production, but also has a consistent quality. Uh, this is really important for brands that 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 are um, using your specialty rice for a specific for a specific audience. Uh, it needs to be the same experience today as tomorrow and all the days after. So it has to be the same. Um, and it has to be, uh, of course, compliant to, to the European uh, regulations and uh, residue levels. Um, you can select your market channel based on the rice that you have selected. Uh, you have mainstream uh, specialty rice, but also like a really niche uh, product. Um, and these uh, channels are definitely uh, different, like I showed you in the, in the previous slides. Um, and select your partner. Um, you, there are several ways to find a partner. Uh, I would suggest to, to go to the main trade fairs in Europe um, and, uh, and talk with different people, uh, but really make a difference between like the really the bulk uh, importers and really the specialized buyers. And for specialty wise, 
for most specialty wise, I would go for a specialized buyer that 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 is really looking for a partnership with uh, with you. Uh, so hopefully, I'm still within time, more or less. <laughs> Not exactly, well, you're, but you're rounding up. So uh, thank you very much for that presentation, Michelle. It was filled with uh, very good information. I would like to invite... Nice, if there are any questions. Sorry? It was a bit fast, but I, if there are any questions, of course, we can go. We have a lot of questions time. and I would... Uh, Job is already back online. Welcome back, Job. And I would really like to take out a few extra minutes to see if we can answer as many questions as possible. And for our audience, we said that the webinar would end at um, in about five minutes time. If you can stay to answer to hear the answers to the rest of the questions no problem as i said we are recording this webinar so you are going to get a recording and you're going to be able to hear all the questions and answers um if you are able to stay we are going to continue for a few more minutes i think a maximum of 10 maybe 15 minutes to see if we can answer as many questions as possible um, let's see, where do I start? There are a couple, there are a lot of questions and there are still questions coming in and please do feel free to ask your questions. We have a question from uh, Nguyen who says, can you give me examples of big buyers? I think Nguyen that I would refer you to the CBI market study, which can be found on the CBI website. We're going to show you where exactly. And you're going to have uh, some examples of buyers, European buyers that might be of interest to you. And uh, yup, there are a number of questions, quite a number of questions actually from exporters who are interested in how do I register for the SRP, how can the SRP help me, help, help to connect me to buyers, uh, how do I get SRP expertise to work with me. I think I would like to ask you to just give a very brief, maybe direction to a website page, just a very brief answer to how do we work with you? Yeah. Yeah, for that, can you hear me or? We can. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I really uh, want to refer to the website, sustainablerice.org. And we actually revamped the whole website, so it's more um, uh, friendly for the for the user. So in that, you also have specific, specific sections on all the manuals on how you can become a member, what benefits you have, as well as all the contact details. Okay. And uh, Win is also very addressable, so you are uh, very free also to send an email directly to Win okay. and to set with him. And maybe I can ask the CBI support team to share both the website and the email address in the chat. So that is sustainablerice.org and Win's email, which I don't actually remember off the top of my mind, but it's in the presentation. So if CBI could, slide, could share that with the audience, that would be perfect. Um, Rue is saying, we're seeing a lot of demand, significant demand from European buyers, but we're not seeing enough supply. When is the supply of SRP rice going to increase? I think, Job, that's a question for you. Yeah, yeah we are saying the same to Win. So uh, Win has to uh, pick up this challenge, and but also need actually, that's why this uh, this uh, panel is so important that we create more awareness around SRP, also on the producers, on the farmers, on the exporters, to start uh, uh, producing sustainable rice. So we are on top of it, and also, yeah, we we were surprised actually by this immense increase in demand. So a little bit uh, behind, but also as uh, Win already said, we can start from tomorrow. You know, we don't need like a three years transition period, which makes it uh, more easy to be agile. And I think that's a very key point to, um, to reiterate to our listeners, that if you want to start producing sustainable rice, you can actually start implementing the guidelines of the sustainable rice platform from today. And maybe, I don't know how long it takes, but maybe in a few weeks to a few months, your rice can be sustainable I'll be marked as sustainable, verified, and you can actually start exporting that rice to the EU. So I would say make sure to look at the website of the Sustainable Rice Platform. And to Imran and others who are asking, can we get this presentation? Yes, we are recording it. We are going to send you the slides and you are going to get this presentation and the recording of the webinar, including the questions and answers. Sabir has a question for Michel, and he says, is there any agency in the EU that provides guidance on quality requirements and import criteria? Michel? 
Um, well, specifically for WISE, I, I couldn't mention one specifically, um, but um, I think I think a lot of information you can also find uh, on, online, general information about, about food requirements. Uh, then you should definitely go to the website of the European Commission. Uh, there's, for example, you have uh, access to markets, uh, my trade assistant. Uh, where you can fill in the the rice the the HS code for rice, um, the origin and the destination country, and there you will find also a lot of well, typical uh, things that you need to to export your rice to to Europe. I think that's a, that's the best way to to start. Um, and of course, when you uh, when you're dealing with a specific client, uh, that is also a good source of information. Of course, they have all the experience, both good and bad, of course. Um, and they can they can partly guide you as well uh, with the with the last uh, last bit of, uh, of uh, well of, of combining two different requirements, um, which may be a bit different as well between different buyers. So the uh, the last mile I would definitely do with uh, the buyer themselves. Okay, and uh, Sabir as well as anyone else who is interested, this information is also in the market study. So the um, access to markets, uh, etc. All that information, as well as the the links to the EU website, they are included in the market study, and you are going to receive the market study in the email after the webinar as well. So you can look it up. You don't need to memorize it. Um, we have a number of questions about organic certification, and I'm just going to throw them out there and see who in the panel is best suited to answer them. Sumit says. Organic certification is flawed in India. So how do we maintain that with sustainable rice? Yup, that would, might be a question for you to start with. Yeah, I don't, I don't uh, really know how to answer that one, but um, I was, uh, I, I wanted to add to uh, the difference because you have like SRP verified rice, which you can really put it like on with a label and eh, with a logo on it. But you also have sustainable rice, which is like used uh, produced in sustainable manners, as um, as uh, instructed by the sustainable rice platform, and that is also a must balance. So also within the whole transition, there is a lot of like variety to play into sustainable rice. Uh, production as well as SRP verified rice to really put the logo on it then you have to meet like 90% of the criteria and it has to be like outstanding in all the pro uh, processes but sustainable rice is actually also very easily to uh, or e more easily to uh, to obtain that standard I so, can... but I don't know um, how I can um, I can imagine that this is a question that is relevant to a lot of countries because a lot of countries might struggle with the certification process that is flawed or that is not entirely perfect. So uh, I think this is relevant. Misha, yes. is there anything to add? Yeah, I think the tip I would give you that um, organic is definitely an interesting market. Um, it's at the moment, it's probably more required than, than an SAP label. Uh, for a lot of buyers, uh, but that might be that might turn around in the future. Organic is a, is a speciality uh, that is not easy for for a lot of companies, and I would only certify organic if you're really up to the, up to the task. Uh, like I said in my presentation, um, if uh, a lot of I know there's a lot of adultery, uh, and there's there's of course proof in India now when five certifiers have been blacklisted so recently. Um, and this is really bad for the reputation of a country. So there are a lot of buyers, not only for rice, but also a lot of other products uh, that they purchase in India. They, they're moving away from that because they don't trust the source. Um, so it's it's really it, 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 it's better not to do organic if you're not up to the task um, and only specialize in it. If, if you have the right mindset and, and you're able to comply with the requirements. Um, otherwise, yeah, focus on sustainable rice at least, um, which yeah, which, which has a lot of potential for for growth as well, and mm. it's it's probably less difficult than the really specific organic uh, legislation. Mm. And, yeah, uh, and maybe yep. to add to that, there's another trend of uh, retailers uh, setting their own norms yeah, that go mo most further than organic or fair trade. So there's also that trend, you know, that um, 
retailers and big buyers are really like pushing their own limits and also pushing their own um, criteria, which are actually more advanced than um, most of the other criteria. And when it comes to sustainable rice, the sustainable rice platform can obviously help uh, exporters uh, yeah. verify their exports. Michel, um, what you were saying ties in very nicely to a question that came in from Mohamed. And Mohamed says, our product, Japonica sticky rice, is chemical free and pesticide free, but we don't have the organic certification. Can we export to the European market without the organic certification? And I would add, how? Definitely, yes, of course. Not you cannot export it as organic rice, obviously. Um, but um, having a, a pest-free, residue-free rice, that's 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 a basic requirement. Um, so yes, you can definitely export it. Um, the only thing is, you, you just need the right uh, to find the right buyer uh, that that is willing to uh, to buy your product. So Mohamed, I would definitely say look into sustainable rice and look into the sustainable rice platform because they might be able to link you with buyers as well. And I think CBI is also able to link you with uh, with some buyers. There's also some buyers mentioned in the market study on, on specialty rice. Um, we have another question here from Wais Kabir. He says, Rice is a food security commodity in Asia and the biodiversity of rice is very wide. Is there any potential for small grain aromatic rice from Bangladesh or South Asia? As mentioned already, like uh, Kalojira or some other rain fed rice. And I think when he is asking about the potential for small grain rice, it's probably the potential for export to Europe. Who would like to take that question? Okay. Um... I think I think the most important thing, uh, and it, it, maybe I referred to the previous question at the same time as well. The most important thing is to find the niche for your specific rice variety. Um, so um, if you have a glutinous rice, uh, maybe it's maybe it's a good sushi rice. You can you can sell it as as, as su sushi rice, for example. If it's a rain-fed rice, um, use that information to. Uh, to promote your product um, because it's, it's different from from other rice uh, varieties so everything that makes your product unique uh, or uh, suitable for specific niche uh, can be a specific rice dish uh, an ethnic uh, uh, in the ethnic channel uh, a, a, a certain consumer group um, make sure that you highlight the specific characteristics of your rice and then find the, the right target group uh, that would be interested in, in your rice. Um, that connection, I think, is, is most important in defining if, if you have uh, an opportunity for your rice and, and how big it, it could be. Okay, thank you for that. And we have another question here from Ritesh, who says, can you tell us, and Michel, I think this question is for you. Ritesh says, can you tell us about the registered exporter system and its benefits are you familiar with that is that a question for me yes okay sorry um no as a european importer you need to be registered um uh, so as an exporter i don't i don't think that's uh, that's something to really focus uh, focus on um, so only if you are a company that is willing to uh, invest in, in their own uh, importing business within Europe, yes, then you have to you have to look into it and you have to be a registered uh, importer. Um, but that's uh, that's it. Okay, thank you for that. And looking at the time, we need to start wrapping up. So. If you have more questions, you can direct them to the Sustainable Rice platform or contact CBI through the information that we're going to share with you in a minute. And I see that the information about the Sustainable Rice platform has already been shared in the chat. Um, Alaya, you're asking about how to become an exporter to the Netherlands. That information can be found in the market study about specialty rice. And Amy, your question about how to export to Switzerland I'm not entirely sure, Michelle, if that was addressed in the market study. Was Switzerland one of the countries no. that was included? 
that's it's not 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 specifically um but yes uh, switzerland is not part of the european exactly. union they have a couple of a couple of their own uh, rules of course but they follow much of the same guidelines as the european union so amy it might be a good idea for your for your ngo to review the market study about specialty rights to get a general overview of the requirements and then to contact trade for uh, trade fairs or uh, potential buyers in switzerland to get the actual uh, specifics about requirements for exporting to Switzerland. I would like to thank our panel for joining us for this Q&A session. And I would like to invite uh, Arta from CBI to step in and share some information about where we can find the information about, share some information about where we can find the market study, sorry. Sure, uh, Tonya. If you can hand me the presenter rights, please. So uh, we've almost reached the end of this webinar. And before I give uh, one more time the word back uh, to Tony for the closing of the webinar, I'd like to uh, make use of one minute to highlight our online uh, platform. Um, to go there, you should type into your browser cbi.eu slash market information. And there you will see that we have over 20 studies for the grains and pulses sector. And these studies can be categorized in three categories, mainly information that's interesting for the sector as a whole. We have studies on tips, like for example, tips to find buyers and tips to do business. And we have studies about specific products like the topic of today, um, how to export rice to Europe. Um, I also want to show you this in one second, uh, what it looks like in an internet browser. Um, but unfortunately, I am unable to, or I am able to share my browser. Here we go. So here I've typed in CBI Center for Promotion of Imports for Developing Countries in Google. And there we go. We see the CBI website. Scroll a little bit down in the middle. The second button is market information. And then you get to the home page. You can see that we serve a lot of more sectors with market research information but of course today i am interested in grains pulses and oil seeds which is very handy on the top left so there we go to the grains pulses and oil seeds sector um, we've covered a lot of ground today i just want to highlight uh, two studies to give you an example of what our market studies look like one very popular study is the tip study how to find buyers which you find on the right hand side on the left hand side we have the sector studies that I was mentioning and on the right hand side we have the tips studies so tips to find buyers for example if you would like to engage and you would make to uh, make a list of possible um, companies that could be interesting for you to contact uh, one such tip is using the member list of trade associations when I click on that tip, and then I see that, for example, for rice, I'm sorry, we have a pop-up on the website, <laughs> which is blocking my screen. For rice, you see that we have the Federation of European Rice Millers, which represents 90% of the European rice milling industry, uh, which has a member list. Um, if I go a little bit further down, another tip which is given, register with trade directories. So here you can see, there's a number of trade directories where you can make your company profile. So that's also an interesting tip. And then to total, there are uh, about eight or nine tips, which I really recommend that you visit. Um, going back to the main page, I would really, if you have not already yet done it, uh, recommend you to subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, you can also select only the grains sector, uh, and that way you will receive notifications um, on our monthly newsletter whenever we have new studies. Here on, on the bottom, we see the product studies, topic of today, um, of course, specialty rice. Here you will see that we always have split our studies into two parts, one on the European side, the market potential. So that's basically the question that you wanna ask, which markets would I would like to target? We've seen in Michelle's presentation earlier, for the example of the UK, example of the Netherlands. That's something that you can find in this study. Second, once you know which markets to target, then the big question is, what requirements could I fulfill? What are the channels? Who are my competition? And what are the prices? To give you a sneak peek, 
the channels this is a very interesting chapter if you look at the channels i'm scrolling a bit down we're over time i'm doing this fast so please visit after today's session you see here for example there are a number of importers and traders mentioned there are brokers mentioned that are interested in buying rice and you see rice millers and brands which also came back in today's presentation um, so i think that's it for today if you still have another question for cbi after this webinar you can always ask us your questions you see also here a button that says ask your question and uh, with that i would uh, uh, yeah, take the opportunity to um, say thank you to all of you for joining us today Thank you for your time. Thank you for your good questions. I would also like, of course, to thank our great panel, uh, Mr. Wayne Ellis, Mr. Job Blom, and of course, uh, Michel Paperkamp. And thank you, uh, Tonia, for moderating this session. And, and then I would like to give back the word to you for the closing of the session. Thank you, Arthur. And as Arthur said, uh, all the information can be found on the CBI website. So do make sure to uh, take a look at the website because we shared a lot of information and I can imagine that it is just too much to take in in a one and a half hour. Um, we are going to send you an email with a recording of uh, today's webinar, a link to the recording of today's webinar, the presentations and the link to the market study. And we're going to ask you to fill out a short survey at the end of the webinar to tell us how we did. Um, do you have any recommendations for us to improve? Was it perfect? If it was perfect, give us a 10. If it was horrible, give us a one. And we hope obviously that you're going to give a number that is closer to, well, closer to 10 actually than a, than a one. Art has already thanked our experts, uh, so I won't go over that again, but it was an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. And for our attendees, you can see on the screen um, the upcoming webinars. And I just want to point out one on November 25th, the Agri Blockchain uh, webinar. Job mentioned it, I think it was Job or Wynn mentioned it in their presentation that blockchain is going to be uh, a much bigger factor when it comes to food and when it comes particularly to sustainable rice that we we're talking about today. So that webinar might be of interest uh, to you if you are planning to export to the EU. Just check on the CBI website, cbi.eu slash events for an overview of all the webinars, the starting times and how to register. And that just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for your patience. We exceeded the time, but I hope it was very useful to you. And we hope to see you again at one of our other webinars. Thank you so very much and have a great day.